Hey everyone, my name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and we're going to be recording episode 311 of Astronomy Cast for your space pleasure. Um, now, you might be wondering what happened to 310. 310 happened during the Hangout-a-thon, uh, which was great. We had a wonderful conversation with uh, with Matt Kaplan from uh, from the Planetary Society, and it was so episode-esque that we decided it's going to go right into the stream. So uh, you can dig through the Hangout-a-thon to find it, or just wait, and it'll pop into the feed. I'm sure at some point we'll chop it up and make it uh, there. So hi, Pamela. Hi. So where are you? I am in Turku, Finland, where even though it's 10 p.m. at night, my room is lit by the open window because the sun is kind of refusing to set enough to make it actually dark. <laughs> and so you were, you were trying to get some photographs last night, right? It's well, yeah. It, not last night. It was two nights ago. I was in Helsinki, and I I landed and I got in at eight thirty in the morning. So I figured I'd take a short nap and then go walk the city and take some photos in the late afternoon light. Except late afternoon looked like bright day and the light wasn't pretty and golden <laughs> or anything. So I just kind of went back to sleep. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you still feeling it's, it? How's your How's your um how you well, right I now? I kind of slept the entire day I got here. Like, went to bed around 11 a.m., slept until 7 p.m., recorded some audio for 365, went back to bed, and uh, now I'm fine. I oh, don't think I've had that much sleep in like months. Really? Oh, I f I find going forward in time like that to be just brutal. Coming back, it's no problem. But for, to go oh, I'm the opposite. Oh, going yeah. Going west kills me. No, I oh, it was awful. Um, so okay, oh right, and so last week, uh, you had to cancel. I did. Uh, and, and why did you have to cancel, Pamela? Because because I had poison ivy all over my face, my arms, my legs. I was transmuting into a zombie. I in fact frightened small children and got stared at when I left the house. It was not pleasant. I I got what? poison ivy on my hands, picking up a bad a bad a uh, uh, picking up a bale of bad hay, and I wasn't oh. wearing gloves. And I, I was sweating profusely because it was really hot and I was doing outside labor and the poison ivy on my hands, I wiped across my forehead, I rubbed my eye, I went down my neck oh. and I the entire right side of my face, it was Scarface going on and, and I'd had my Google Glass on so then I got it all behind my ear, and yeah, it was just all kinds of wrong. And now my eye still itches. So you're so, still suffering from this. this that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. No, no makeup for me for a while. Yeah, we do not have uh, poison ivy here, pretty much. Yeah, we do. Yeah. It's it it grows in the English ivy, so you don't see it. And how the heck it got in a bale of hay, I don't know. But this wasn't our hay. It was a bale of hay that someone who came for a horse show abandoned. It was just horrible. Oh. Um, and I'm going, I'm going away uh, tomorrow. Well, today, actually. I'm going to go to Hornby Island, which is the, my sort of my childhood home. And we're going to be uh, hanging out, taking a bunch of photographs with the family. It's going to be great. I'm taking the That's 14 mil. Awesome. I'm going to try and do some like deeps because the sky is so dark. It's black. Yeah. So I'm going to try and you know try and watch for some meteors. Try and get some deep sky Milky Way. 14 stuff. millimeters is a huge field of view. Yeah, it's gigantic. Yeah, it's a really big field of view. So it's a it's a great lens. Yeah, it's a it's Corey Corey Schmidt says the same one. We have a, a Rokinon. Um, yeah, it's the Rokinon 14 millimeters. Manual everything, but it's relatively cheap for just a gigantic amount of glass. So I'm really looking That's forward to awesome. this. That's awesome. Um. Okay, so uh, f so if anyone has never done this before, what this is is we're going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast, which is our weekly podcast about space and astronomy. We've done 311 episodes, so if you enjoy this, feel free to dig through our archive. There is mountains there for you. Uh, we never get the complaint that we don't have enough shows for people anymore. 
Uh, and so while we're recording, uh, we'll take about 25 minutes or so to do the actual show itself, and there may be a little extra um, sort of a bit in the show itself that's going to you're going to have already heard it. Um, and then uh, and then we'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards and, and answer some a questions that you A very few because have. I'm preventing someone from going to sleep. Oh, really? Okay, all right. Uh, that's, that's very kind of this person. <laughs> all for Astronomy Cast. All for Astronomy Cast. Um, okay, great. Well, then let's, uh, let's get rolling then. So you're, you're okay. ready to record? Yeah. I am pressing record. It oh. is recording. I am also pressing record. Cool. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 311 for Monday, June 17th, 2013. Sound. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. And where are you? I am in Turku, Finland. Turku, Finland. There must be some good reason why you're there. I am here for the European Week of Astronomy and Space Science, where I'm working with the Galileo Teacher Training Program uh, to educate a group of 13 teachers on how to better get astronomy into their classroom. And uh, I spent today over at the main part of the conference listening to speakers and uh, Mostly, I, I have to admit, I'm enjoying some of the very weird things that I'm noticing here. Like what? Like, the, it's apparently a thing to have a restaurant that is kebab and pizza. And, oh, and sure. this is not a combination I've ever seen before. So the kebab pizzeria is a thing in, in Finland. If you like fish, they sure do really good fish there in, in, uh, in Finland. I, I haven't seen the fish. I've just seen the kebab pizzerias. <laughs> the kebab pizzerias. There's a bunch of those. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, cool. So, uh, is, and then you've got a few more things in, that are happening in Europe, right? You got... Yes. So I'm, I'm going from here to Nucleo in Lisbon, Portugal. And I'll be there for two weeks. And from there, I'm going to Velos, Greece, where I'm going to spend, I think it's 10 days, uh, working with the Global Hands-On Universe folks. So Carl Pennypacker will be there. We're going to be working on trying to figure out how to integrate CosmoQuest into the global teaching community. That sounds great. I am officially jealous. Um, OK, well, let's, uh, let's get on with the show then. So shh, shh. You can stop screaming. That's because nobody can hear you in space. But why not? How does sound work here on Earth? And what would it sound like on other planets? So uh, um, let's get on with the sound. So like, I want to go straight to that, which is, uh, which is you know, that famous saying that in space no one can hear you scream, which comes it's from true. Alien. It's true. It's so then, true. So then what, how does sound work? Sound is a compression rate wave when it goes through a solid, a liquid, or a gas most of the time. Sometimes in solid, it's also created by a shear wave, a, a, a wave that the wave front is perpendicular to the direction of motion. Most of the time with air and water, it's just a compression wave, which you can imagine with a slinky, it's, it's where the, the air gets compressed and that area that's compressed is small and narrow and moving through space. So as I speak, I'm sending waves of compressed air out away from my mouth. And they are hitting the microphone and jangling the microphone. It. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I believe the technical term is jangling, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, right. So so we've got the situation where, you know, in this case with you talking in the air like what is causing just even these oscillations to begin? It, it's a physical motion. In this case, it's my vocal cords are physically moving the air. In the case of musical instruments, you have uh, your breath is compressing things in various ways. If it's a stringed instrument, it's the vibrations of the string that are moving the air. So it, it's literally a physical motion where something is physically pushing on the air. Injecting and, energy into the air, and that energy propagates through waves. Right, and this is where it gets kind of surreal when you really think about it, that, that when we hear things, 
you know, we're just sensing these compression waves, you know, moving moving back and forth against our eardrums, and then our brain is converting that into sound. And and the neat thing is, I mean, poetically, if you think about it, uh, every time you hear someone playing a wooden a woodwind instrument or a horn instrument, you're hearing someone blow in your ear. <laughs> right, <laughs> from far away. Yeah, and I and mutated. Kind of unnerving, through. I think, is what that is. Yeah, creepy. <laughs> creepy, yeah, yeah, very creepy, <laughs> uh, like a stalker. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Right. Okay. So we've got the situation where you've got the these compression waves that are moving through the medium, mm -hmm. and so what affects the sound? It's it's a combination of what is the medium uh, made of and what is its density. So different mediums have different impedance to air propagate, not air. Different mediums have different impedance for sound waves moving through them. Uh, so, so some things, for, for instance, some solids are much more uh, happy to have compression waves move, th move through them, so they have less impedance. Um, but then the density of the material also matters. So when the density goes up, the speed actually slows down. And, and this kind of makes sense because it's the energy that it takes to move all of those atoms. Um, the higher the density, the more energy is needed to move them. And uh, so the sound waves, it, it's, it's not literally a, it takes more energy because then the sound speed wouldn't be constant in the medium. But um, the, the higher the density, the uh, slower the speed of the waves going through. Now, we have like the speed of sound. When you say the speed of sound, you know, if you're going to say that very technically, you say the speed of sound in air. Air at, at a certain at a certain pressure, yeah, at sea level, at room temperature. 20 degrees Celsius at sea level is the standard uh, standard way it's quoted. Um, but, but as you move through the atmosphere, what you experience in terms of sound changes in ways that probably aren't perceptible. So, so for instance, uh, just if you look only at temperature, uh, the, the speed of sound decreases as it gets colder and increases as it gets hotter. Uh, if, if instead of looking at temperature, you look at altitude, um, as, as you go up in altitude, the speed uh, decreases to a point, but then it's this weird interplay between the density, the composition, and the temperature that causes it to go back up again. Um, so, so there's lots of weird factors that all come into play with figuring this out. But in general, lower pressure makes the sound go faster, is that right? In general, lower pressure makes the sound go, uh, lower pressure is lower density, uh, makes the sound go, sorry, doing math in my head while jet lagged, lower density means the sound goes slower. Okay, okay, right. Because it's almost like the they need to move further to find more molecules to bump into. Wait, um, sorry. It's lower, lower density. That's the number on the bottom of the equation. So when the number on the bottom goes down, the number on the top goes up, so the velocity goes up as the density goes down. Okay, do you want to answer You're that watching? question again? Yes, I do. You all get to watch me jet-lagged doing math in my head. Uh, so, so pressure, if, if you look at it in terms of density, as the density uh, goes down, the sound speed ends up going up. Uh, so it, it's again, it's one of these things where you have to take care, take care to track all of the different things in what you're discussing um, when you're trying to figure out what the answers are. Um, now, pressure and density aren't always the same thing. So when you're dealing with an ideal gas instead of dealing with with a solid or a non-ideal gas. Then you have pressures at the top of the equation. There's an impedance involved. It, in this case, it's called the adiabatic index. Density still on the bottom. So if you hold the density constant, so the number of atoms per square centimeter per meter, however you want to measure the density, if that density stays constant, um, 
as the pressure goes up, so you're increasing temperature or something to increase the pressure, then as the pressure goes up, the speed goes up. All right, so, this, doing this math in your head is going to be important because I'm going to, you know, we're about to talk really about... You really don't like me today. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I want to talk about, about sound on other worlds, right? So, um, because, I mean, I think of, like, you've done that experiment, right, where you have helium, you, you know, you breathe in some helium and then you breathe yeah. it out and, and your, your voice goes up. So the pitch goes up, so the sound waves are going faster. Is that right? Um, the wavelength of the sounds that are made by... So this is where it gets confusing because right. of how your vocal cords are vibrating. It's, it's the vibration of your vocal cords that gets changed. So your vocal cords are vibrating in a, a medium that's made of a completely different ideal gas. Um, than, than the nitrogen it's normally in. And there's other gases that you can inhale that I'm not going to name because there's been cases of people accidentally killing themselves um, that are much heavier than normal air. And so when you inhale them and exhale them while speaking, it totally lowers the pitch of yeah. your voice. Now the problem is you have to stand up, upside down or hang upside down and cough all this gas out or it can suffocate you because it is heavier than normal air. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, people die from helium as well. Yeah. Um, so okay. So then. So then. I mean, we were just talking about air, but like we've got other mediums that we can deal with. And I mean, I know that you can hear sound underwater. Right. For quite a distance, even. Yes, and and the speed of of sound underwater is actually much faster. So one of the neat things is, if you use a. Um, starting sound underwater versus uh, in the air uh, and and so you have a dolphin 10 feet away from the starting sound and a human 10 feet away from the starting sound there's a minuscule difference that will give the dolphin the advantage oh like he already um, needed an advantage in <laughs> the water. It's, it's just more fun to use that example but but it is neat to think about over great distances if you shout across a lake versus sending the sound through the water under the lake through the water the sound will get there faster right yeah um, okay so now we we talked about this a bit so let's imagine some other worlds then so let's imagine if we tried to sort of take sound over to say Venus where the atmospheric pressure is 92 times uh, greater than Earth, the temperature is like 400 degrees. Like, what would happen? See, you didn't warn me you were going to do this. I was going to. Oh, should you have done the math in advance? Well, we can just skip that question. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So, so this this again falls falls into the the problem of what's the density versus what's the pressure. And, the and then you, you also have to look at the temperature and you have to look at the, the composition because different gases will have different sound speeds. So it actually gets very complex trying to sort all of this out. I'm going to Google it. <laughs> this is so exciting for our audience to watch. A uh, new scientist is saying you might sound like a Smurf on Venus. There you go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So now, then I think, you know, to sort of get to take this to the space context, we need to talk about why you, nobody can hear you in space. So, and, go ahead. And it, it comes down to the fact that there is no medium. You have nothing to have a compression wave. So if you're in a dense enough nebula, if you're in the outer layers of a star, then you can have a speed of sound. Then you can have sound waves propagating through the medium. But if there isn't that stuff to have the compression wave moving through, you won't get any sound. Uh, one of the things that ends up happening a lot in, in astronomy classes is you find yourself having to calculate the speed of sound because it starts to become relevant for different physics. And it's kind of neat to think about the fact that all these different conditions have different speeds of sound. Now, now, one thing you need to be careful not to get confused, though, is how a human being would sound speaking in these different mediums. Because, again, that's, that's our vocal cords. That's like the string on, on a guitar getting changed, uh, not necessarily the speed changing. Right. So, so, I guess, back to your star thing. So, if you did fall into the sun 
and screamed, somebody else falling into the sun a little behind you would be able to hear you. Would be able to hear you as they died violently. Yeah, yeah. As, <laughs> you know, hitting 5,800 Kelvin is going <laughs> to well, ruin your when, day. When, one of the, the things that comes up out of this, though, is submarines actually have to be very careful when they're running silent to not vibrate because water does transmit all of the sounds. So if you're in one submarine and you drop a wrench and the sound goes rattling through your, your submarine, the outer hull of the submarine, it, depending on how it's built, most modern ones are built to isolate sound as much as possible, but uh, the old ones especially, that dropped wrench would send vibrations through the water and that's the whole principle behind sonar is, is you're reflecting sound waves off of other things and a good sonar operator while they're listening for the ping to return will also catch in the mix the sound of of the blades of the submarine, the sound of the dropped wrench, even the chatter of humans getting propagated through the water. Huh, wow. And so the, the workaround, if you want to sort of talk in space, is let's say you know, you're an astronaut and I'm an astronaut and we need to talk, what do we do? Uh, if you want to talk without using radio waves that can be picked up by other people, you use Morse code with a light. Right. And that's kind of lame, but... Yeah. Uh, that's that's what you do is you use lights. Now, what about like touching the helmets together? Would that work? Well, you can do that, but I'm assuming you're far enough away. Um, right, but no, say that, you that were... is entirely true. And that would you work can, too. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's just a matter of the the two helmets uh, transmitting the waves between the two helmets. Right. Same so you've the got the you've got the air transferring to the glass, and then the glass is the medium to the other glass, yeah. and then the other glass to you. And but so so then you know when we look at all of these science fiction shows with these explosions and fiery bursts. Yeah, and those are pew, all pew, pew, silent. Pew. Right. Silent. So completely silent. So so it, let's, you know, provide a scientific version. You know, and if there's any science fiction writers, any science fiction show people watching this right now, this is what it would sound like. Nothing. Nothing. Well, not you wouldn't even hear the word nothing. Right. So so let's imagine, you know, some <laughs> big space battle with, with ships flying past and they pew 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 and they're shooting each other. What would that really you know, I mean, you wouldn't hear the explosions on the other ship. You wouldn't hear, the, but, but you would hear one, things happening to your ship. You would hear things happening to your ship, and you would hear if there was some sort of a shock wave of another ship exploding, all of the gas escaping. That that sort of a shock wave hitting your own ship, you'd hear your hull responding to it. Right. So that ship would be like firing out a compression wave. There'd be gas, or yeah. And that gas would be slamming against your ship, and then you would hear yeah. those sounds. Yeah. Like even if like someone detonated a nuclear bomb just like out in space. Silent. Really. Yeah. And but would you would there be because there wouldn't be a pressure wave. No, it's a it's a radiation pressure. Yeah. But but that's a completely different experience. With with nuclear bombs in our own atmosphere, it's it's the pressure of the expanding gas that does so much damage. Uh, you do it without the atmosphere involved, and it's just a silent blast of deadly light. Now, now, have you ever heard this sort of comment that the sort of lowest sound in the universe is the rumbling made by a by black a supermassive black hole? Yeah, and and I have to admit that's one of those things that just kind of bothers me because it's the poetic license that that press officers go to in order to try and get journalists like you to read their press release. I sure did, and then I reported on it. What did I do wrong? You you got suckered in right. by by someone desperately wanting you to write about what they had. And and I mean the truth is there there are various waves that propagate around supermassive black holes depending on what sort of shock waves are taking place, depending on how things are getting drug in, uh, and and those waves moving through the accretion disk. Those those are compression waves. They're shock waves. It's traveling at the speed of sound in some cases. And as you watch these shock waves propagate through a medium, 
well, a wave moving through a medium is the definition of a sound. Right. But we don't think of them as tones or anything like that. Um, it's the the more realistic uh, analogy is is the ringing of uh, acoustic waves inside of stars. Um, there, the the acoustic waves actually tell you something about the interior of the star, and that's well, kind of sorry. Neat. What's these acoustic waves? What's going on here? I just depending on uh, how the the star is set up, all sorts of different stars, for reasons we're still working to understand, have a, a vi variety of different seismic and acoustic waves that you can see uh, in in the fine resolution light curves. Uh, there was a project called Gong that looked at our sun, uh, looking for for high resolution variations. Uh, and, and the models of these things show stars basically flexing in, in a variety of different longitudinal, longitudinal and radial waves. Right, and I can just imagine the press release now. Gong find, gong scientists find sun rings like a bell. Yeah, pretty much. I'm sure that one was written at some yeah, point. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, <laughs> right, but but the point you know you were mentioning before, right, that that the the sun is a gas, and it you know yeah. it can absolutely propagate sounds, and so yeah. you can have these sounds. So I wonder, right? So if you had like a, I don't know, like an X class flare or like a magnetic field disconnect mm -hmm. and reconnect, would the sound of that you know the snapping well so, travel so again, across the star? Yes, but but we don't think of it as sound. We think of it as a compression wave moving through a medium. Yeah. And and so this is sort of like the radio waves that we use for our television, the microwaves that heat your food in your microwave. Those are all light, but we don't normally think of them as light. So in these cases, all these different waves going through stars, all these different compression waves moving through a medium, yeah, that's the same thing as a sound, but we don't think of it that way. Now, we did an episode uh, back at Halloween, which we called Spooky Sounds from Space. Yeah. But we were kind of doing it, too, because, you know, you can't hear any sounds from Saturn. You can't hear any sounds from pulsars yeah. and such. So, so you know, in those situations, I mean, what's what's going on here, right? There's some kind of conversion going on, that there's some propagation. That's just radio waves getting converted. So what we were talking about was radio waves getting converted into audio waves. So if you record the radio signals coming from these different sources, or in the case of objects moving through the atmosphere, the actual radio from radio stations getting reflected off of them as they move through the atmosphere. Um, we're used to AM, FM, television. We change radio waves into audio all the time through amplification processes, through modulation. Um, all people are doing is listening to the naturally occurring light that comes out in the radio bands and converting it into audio that instead of seeing it with our eyes, we hear it with our ears. Right, and so, I mean, we're transferring from the electromagnetic spectrum, in this case radio, but you could imagine, yeah. I don't know, converting gamma rays to... to oh, yeah, you could... Right? Or you could translate the slow change in color of a Cepheid variable into a very slow si slide whistle tune. <laughs> right, right. And I guess, you know, I mean, energy can be changed, and so you can have a situation where, you know... Radiation Some, becomes acoustical energy. Yeah, yeah. You know, as it explodes something. So it's not entirely craziness. Um, cool. Well, I think uh, there was, I don't know if I, I had anything else to talk about. That was about all the, I was trying to sort of force the sound <laughs> to be as spacey as I could. And so that was the, the direction that I went. No, I think I'm just going to wrap it up. And I know you've got okay. to wrap this up too, so it'll be a little bit of a shorter one. So thank you very much, Pamela. My pleasure. All right, I'm going to stop this. And and are you going to still be in Hornby next Monday? Uh, no, I'll be back. Okay, cool. So we can plan to record if all yeah. goes well in Portugal. That's, that if you can have some good internet. I should. That that'd be awesome. Bring this a is a working trip for me. Finally. <laughs> um, okay. Okay.
and I'm going to have to stick this in a new directory for poor Preston. Export it. Hey, tough everybody, and then we will chat. And not for long. Yeah. Let's see what we got here. Um, Sorry for looming. I had to lean closer to hit my keyboard. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. so, uh, you know, Graham Stickings uh, wants to talk about uh, earthquake waves. That's a good point. So earthquake Oh, didn't waves. we talk about those when we did earthquakes a few weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, but I think it's just a good point, right? That that earthquakes are the are compression waves moving through a medium, right? So it is sound. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a that's a great point. Oh, Graham, I should have read that before. So sorry. Um, run silent, run deep. Graham also notes, which is a uh, that's a submarine movie, right? Yeah, that's a yeah. uh, Tom Clancy used it in his books. Um, but yeah, the, I think the classic submarine movie is uh, Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan. And I wonder, right? They're fighting huh? in a, in a nebula. Star Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan is a submarine movie. It, like I know it's okay. spaceships, and I know they're in a nebula. But it's a submarine movie when you you know when you kind of peel it back and take a good look at it. I'm, this is not this is not me thinking. This is this is generally understood by cinema. I'm not a crazy person, <laughs> so so. But but when you think about it, right? You've got these you know these spaceships moving in a completely unrealistic nebula, but maybe there would be sound moving from the nebula, right? If you like blew up one if ship. If it was as dense as it would have to be in that particular movie, yes. Right. But if it was as dense it as it was be. in that particular movie, it's about to form planets. Right, yeah. It's essentially a, a star. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that when I first heard that we could never see a nebula like that, that completely broke my heart. Like, oh. I'm sorry. I know, I know. It's terrible. And for those who like are just joining my understanding of this, um, so why can we never see a nebula the way we see it in in space movies? But because the density of the atoms is so low that you'd be able to see all the way across our solar system before it really started to even have more than a slightly noticeable effect. It's just they they appear thick and pretty because they're light years across and light years away. And we're seeing yeah, the whole thing it. in one compact yeah. area of the sky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Colin Jones says uh, STP, standard temperature and pressure. Yeah, that's the acronym we should have used, yeah. STP. Um, I think that's it. Okay, yeah. So uh, okay. next up, and, or, you put a bunch of the shows on hiatus over the summer, right? Uh, learning space is it's not so much that they're on hiatus as they're not filming live it's pre-recorded content going up so learning space will have pre-recorded content posted Wednesday you're still doing the weekly space hangout yep. on Friday yeah okay so that'll be the next live thing okay but we'd encourage everyone to go check out the 365 days of astronomy content um, youtube.com slash astrosphere vids is where all the video is kept and if you go to cosmoquest.org slash blog slash 365 days of astronomy um, there's there's new content every single day yeah and so so it's really yeah really you know if you want to kind of go back through our content go to astrosphere vids on YouTube and everything we've ever done video wise all of the hangouts all of the shows we've done it's all there there's mountains of 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 information broken up really nicely with uh, you know it's been nicely edited and it's got yeah. uh, explainers and tags and stuff so you can kind of dig through it and so if you're you know if you're looking to do some you know if you're a teacher and you want to have some educational material you should have ample material to help so yeah. And and the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast is continuing to put out new content through the summer. Um, we have two new series, one that is science fiction stories uh, designed to provoke you to think about the science, and the other is a program for children that is uh, being done in collaboration with Universal Awareness. Um, and then so. are you going to be going to Dragon Con this year? Yes. You are? Okay, cool. I'm not, yes. but you are. I think pretty sure Phil yes. is. So, um, okay. we'll, so if people are sort of trying to figure out what to do with their holidays, 
I think there'll probably be some Dragon live Con. done at Dragon Con. So yeah. Yes. There yeah, I'm going to be at the Penny Arcade Expo. So if, uh, if okay. anyone else wants to go and hang out at Penny Arcade, I will be there with the kids. So look me up. All right. Cool. Well, thank you Excellent. very much, Pamela. You can now let everybody okay. go to sleep. And uh, and if okay. I don't talk to you before, we will see you uh, next Monday. In Sounds Portugal. Great. I'll talk to you later. All right. In Portugal. See you later. <laughs>